BPF with C, as gentle an introduction as is possible. My name is Michael Mullen and let's get into it. So first, before we actually go through the agenda, I want to uh, show you the end result of what we're going to be doing today. So the end result is I wanted to learn a little bit about traffic control using BPF. So I wanted to kind of build up a little uh, knowledge base about how to do this. And the easiest way to build up that knowledge base was using C. So what is, what is traffic control? Traffic control is, um, it, it is what it, what it, what it is. It's, it's controlling the traffic on your computer. So specifically what I am doing here, what I'm about to show you is, um, I'm doing a little, um, uh, a firewall for the egress of my computer. So egress is what goes out of the computer. So what I've got here is a little application that stops me from egressing anything on my computer. So you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff being blocked here. And if I try to SSH into another machine, I can't because I'm not allowed to use port 22. If I try to curl on Google, I can't because I can't look up, I can't do a DNS query on google.com. Uh, if I try to uh, curl uh, no, never ssl.com, I can't do that because I can't do a DNS query. So let's open it up a little bit and let's do, um, let's allow myself to do some SSH and to do um, regular um, HTTP, not HTTPS, but HTTP, and do some DNS queries. So now I should be able to use uh, Never SSL, and I can. I can also use Google.com because Google.com allows both um, HTTPS and HTTP. But if I open up a Firefox browser and try to go to say uh, elixir.bootland.com. I can't do that. It's not working. So, but I can still go to neverssl.com because that's just a regular HTTP site. So that's great. Um, so yeah, let's open up, let's open up port uh, 443 for SSL. And now I should be able to do all the things that I'm normally allowed to do on my computer, but my computer won't be egressing any weird stuff that I don't expect it to do. So I can go to this Never SSL, of course, but I can also go to bootlinelixir.com. Um, I can SSH into one of my machines at home. I can use curl on various different sites. All good. I can I can do what I want here, but my computer isn't going to do any weird stuff. So that's why I wanted to go in and kind of learn TC. Um, so for the agenda today, I wanted to talk about why I used C for this project and why uh, I want to use C in various different cases going forward. I also want to talk about why you don't want to want to use C or why I don't want to use C. And then I'll go through some of the code starting from a very simple example of how to do BPF with C going up to that, um, that TC firewall egress um, that I was just showing you. So why, why do we even want to use C anymore? Well, C is a very simple language. It has 33 keywords total, which is a lot less than a lot of other languages. Um, now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is simple. It's not easy in that there are pointers. There's pointers to pointers. There is allocking memory on the heap. There's freeing that memory. There's a whole bunch of different things which make C not easy, but it is simple. It's a very straightforward language. Uh, what you type is what you get. Now for me per, uh, um, specifically, uh, C is my mother tongue. Um, I have been programming in C since grade 10, which is longer than I care to admit. Um, I've been doing it a very, very, very long time. Um, so for me, it's, it's quite natural to be programming in C. 
Um, one of the other good reasons to use C other than other various different languages is that it's good for exploration because C is very low level in that um, with glibc or with other um, libcs like bionic, musil, etc., um, the calls to the, the Linux kernel syscall are the same as the calls you get in glibc or are very close. So for example, the syscall get pid is a glib is exter is extrapolated into the glib c call get pid. So it's 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 pretty one to one if you're exploring on a Linux system. Um, so that's that's a really good reason to use it for exploration. The other reason why you would want to use it for exploration is it doesn't care if you screw up. So like I don't mean like if you forget a semicolon or something like that. It cares about that. But if you if you forget to free memory, it doesn't care. Whatever. If you don't care about it, C doesn't care about it. Um, if you don't check errors. Um, if you don't care about the errors, C doesn't care about the errors, that sort of thing. So you can, um, while exploring, you can make your code really small and kind of easy to to read and get around in um, because it, it C doesn't care about the things you don't care about. Uh, another reason for using C is it's obviously used in a lot of different projects that are already existing. Things like GNOME, Linux, system d various game libraries core utils bin utils read elf all of the various different stuff on your linux machines most of it's going to be programmed in c and if you want to contribute back if you want to understand how it works you're going to have to know c in order to to work with those projects um, one of the important things to know about, uh, one of the important reasons why you would still want to use C is when your program domain demands C. So for example, there are some embedded systems that only have a compiler for C. So you can't use Rust, you can't use Go, you can't use Python, etc., etc. You can only use C. Uh, it's been a while since I did any Arduino work um, but at the time that I was doing some stuff on Arduino, all that you could do at the time was C. Now, I think that might have grown. You might be able to use Python now. I'm not sure. Um, but embedded work is still the domain of C. Um, Rust is catching up, but it's. I don't know all about it because I've, I've less left the embedded world. Um, but yeah, uh, you still need to use C to, to do embedded work. Um, for me specifically, um, BPF is written in C, or a C-like programming language. There is something called AYA, or AYA, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But it, its goal is to use Rust to create uh, BPF programs. And I'll get into the BPF programs for, for the, the beginners here that haven't gone through the other gentle introductions to BPF before. But basically what you're doing when you're, when you're writing a BPF program is you're writing some BPF code in a C-like language, and then you're writing user space code in a different language, uh, such as Rust or Go, or in the case that I'm about to demonstrate, C. Um, you can do uh, BPF user space code in Python if you wanted to. I've got a video about doing that. Um, so yeah, if your domain demands C, of course you have to know C to be able to do what the domain demands. Now, for me specifically, and I, I'm sorry that I keep saying the word specifically, but it's part of my vocabula vocabulary. For me, my preferred language is now Rust. I really like, um, I really like how it gives you not only the power of C, C++, but it gives you some uh, extra bonuses when it comes to memory safety and especially concurrency and parallelism. Doing concurrency and parallelism, let's forget about the safety right now, just doing it raw is very difficult with C. You've got to use p-threads, um, doing um, what people call green threads is... I don't want to even pretend like I know how to use green threads in C or C++. That stuff is just 
forget about it, use Rust, use Go. Um, but yeah, for me, my preferred language is now Rust. Um, but for Rust, the way you use BPF, or the way that I use BPF, is through a library called libbpfrs. libbpfrs is built upon a helper library called libbpfsys, which is a wrapper or a binding around libbpf, which is a C library. Now I want to explore libbpf directly because there are certain features in lib libbpfrs that are currently missing. Um, they are in libbpfsys, and my plan is to learn about the, uh, um, the TC um, extensions in libbpf and libbpfsys in order to put them into libbpfrs. But I first need to learn the, the, the extensions for TC in libbpf with C directly. So it's, it's a learning project that I'm doing right now. And of course, the last reason why you need to use C is because the senior members on the team say, we're using C because we don't like learning. So when do you not want to use C for anything in which you can get away from? Um, when you're starting anything new, there is always a better language for that domain, with the exception of domain-specific things like embedded programming. Uh, programming languages like Rust, Go, Python, Bash. This will give you everything that you need um, to, 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 to do systems programming work. Um, if you include HTML um, and JavaScript, you can now go right up to, to doing stuff on the web. With Node.js, you can do other system programming stuff. Um, you don't need C anymore other than if your senior developers tell you that you have to use C, um, or the domain is specifically, um, you can't, you do not have another compiler available to you. But with these four languages that I put on the screen here, Rust, Go, Python, Bash, that should give you everything that you need. Those are the four languages that if you're a systems programming developer, uh, learn those, um, uh, you might be able to juggle whether you want to be um, an expert within Rust or Go. Um, but yeah, have a, have a good, familiarity, good familiarity with these four languages, and you'll never have to use C again, except when your senior developers tell you you have to. Um, so yeah, uh, now one other thing in which you can even fight with your senior developers about is anything involving concurrency and parallelism. C, C++, just um, it, it just doesn't have the necessary tools to do this sort of work safely and easily. And then you have to, if you've already got a project doing parallelism in C, you might want to really think about rewriting it in Rust because with Rust you can create um, FFI libraries so that your C can call into it so you're not completely evaporating the current C project, you're just just changing the parallelism parts of the project. And rewriting it in Rust for those parallelism parts might actually be easier than having to make a change inside of the C code using P threads or the C++ versions of, of parallelism and threading. So you might be able to fight with your senior developers specifically about concurrency and parallelism um, with regard to this. So yeah, those are the, uh, the pros and cons of using C as I see them. Uh, let's jump into looking at some of this BPF code uh, to, to get you familiar with how do you start exploring libbpf using C. So I've got uh, three, I've got three, three little um, applications for you all. Um, and they are contained within a, a GitHub tree that I've created at um, my username at um, libbpf-sample. And those three programs are to learn about the ring buffer, to just do some really simple, straightforward um, boilerplate 
this is how you do a hello world in BPF with the simple program. And then we've got a much more complex um, traffic control um, egress blocking firewall with this TC program. So let's take a look at some of this code. The, so the first thing that you're gonna wanna be able to do is this simple, this simple program. Oh, I should also mention that if you don't want to learn from me, there is another project called libbpf bootstrap that you can get into. So the libbpf bootstrap um, has examples for both C and Rust. And the reason why I wanted to make, um, make some samples is because um, if you are a newbie to C, reading this make file might be a little bit difficult for you. So I wanted to create a very, very straightforward make file so that you can see all the stages of making a C libbpf program. But yeah, um, looking at libbpf bootstrap is a very good, very good um, starting point if you can, if you're very familiar with make files and stuff like that. Um, it does not get into the TC stuff that I'm, I am about to show you though. So you might want to jump back into my project to look at that traffic control stuff. So yeah, uh, let's look at this simple program. So let's take a look at, um, now, like I said before, um, BPF programs are split into two parts. The first part is your user space program and that's your basic a user space you you should be familiar with with user space programs right now this is this is like copy um, move all of that stuff this is when you're writing a normal hello world program this is this is your this is uh, traditionally called a user space program um, so there's a user space part and there is a BPF slash kernel part so this BPF kernel part is an object kind of that you load into the kernel and it runs inside of the kernel rather than in user space. So let me open up both the user space code and the BPF code. So over on the left here, we've got the BPF code. So this is the code that is going to be inserted into the kernel to run. And it's an extraordinarily simple program. All it does is when uh, sys enter exec VE, the trace point of that is called, um, it will print out to the, the tracing area for BPF that exec was called, and then it'll exit. So that's all it does is it just makes a print and then it goes away. The user space code, what it does is there are three stages. So if you've, if, uh, so first of all, you need to, to bump your, your memory allocation limit. So the amount of um, memory you're allowed to M map, you need to bump that up because um, even this very small BPF program is larger than what you're normally allowed to use with M map. So you, you bump that up just with this um, memlock R limit uh, increase and that function is as you see here, you just set your R limit with some, you just say, give me everything. I want to be able to use all the M map, please. Um, and you need to do that in both Rust and I think you might need to do that in Go as well. I can't remember. Um, now the three, the three parts about libbpf is that first you have to open your, your BPF program. You have to load your BPF program and then you attach. So this is the process of going through and, and kind of reading the source code, reading the, the, the BPF object with these two steps and then shoving it into the kernel with that step. So what you should be asking right now is where are these three functions. Where do they come from? And as you see, I, I don't I don't have a way I don't have them right now. They don't actually exist. Because they are generated code 
through the process which I'm about to demonstrate for you. So uh, pretending that, that these functions exist, what this does is it, it loads, it reads the object file, it shoves it into the kernel, and then it gets the kernel to run it. So it will do, sorry, I was, didn't clean up after myself I was, after I was playing. So go into the simple directory and let's just make this and run it. And the user space isn't gonna do anything, but if we take a look at this tracing area, so this is where the, uh, um, this is where the BPF print K is going to be outputted to this syskernel tracing trace pipe area. You see that the exec is, the exec is called a whole bunch of times. And if I have, let me just run some applications here and you can see them, see them being run. So as I call stuff, you can see that prints are being thrown out. So yeah, there's not much to this, but you should be asking yourself, where did these three functions come through? And that's part of the compilation process. What's happening here is that during the compilation progress, um, there is a generated file for us called execscale.h. So let me let me uh, make this clean and let's take a look at the make file so we can understand the steps that go into the compilation progress process. So forget this first step. The first step here is actually the last step. So I'll come back to that later. But in order, the steps that I take here is first, I generate a vmlinux.h file. And I use a tool called BPF tool to generate the vmlinux.h file. And what it does is it reads through a, um, a Linux kernel provided uh, area called syskernel btf vmlinux. And it just generates kind of, it kind of scrapes through the kernel for all the available structures, um, enums, that sort of thing. Um, let's take a look at VM Linux and, and see what it provides us. So I'm going to make VM Linux. And now we have the VM Linux file here. And let's take a look at that file. And you can see it's, it's kind of shoving out a bunch of type defs. Um, there's a bunch of structures that it gives. And one of the structures that we might be interested in is the task struct. So here's this the task struct. So this task struct is, um, so that BPF tool scraped through the kernel, you can think of it like that, and it gave us the task struct. And this task struct is is a representation of the kernel's task struct that we can see inside of. Uh, if we go into bootlin.com, we can take a look for task struct. So here's the task struct. So this is kind of, it's not an exact one-to-one -one repli uh, replication because it is giving me the task struct as of the kernel I am running. So if I was running, say, the 5.8 kernel, it would give me the task struct from, from here. It would give me this version of the task struct. And this version of the task struct is hopefully forward compatible with the task struct of 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12 going forward. And it's probably backwards compatible, but with, with 5.7, 5.6, 5.5, 5.4, etc., etc., etc. I don't want to make any promises on that, but from my experience um, with this specific structure, if you compile it against a 5.14 kernel, it should still work with a 5.4 kernel. That's not going to be true with 
um, various different structures that are introduced are entirely new within newer kernels. They will not be available in older kernels, and you're going to have problems with that. But yeah, it, uh, it, it kind of gives me, it gives me a task struct that I can work with. So my BPF code can now understand what a task struct is. Um, so yeah, and, and there's a whole bunch of other different, different structs um, that, that uh, the VM Linux will give you. So that's stage one of the compilation progress process is getting the VM Linux file. Stage two is compiling the, your BPF code, so compiling this stuff, into an object file. So you use the clan compiler to do it. And the important stages here is that you're saying that the target is going to be BPF. So it's not going to spit out, um, it's not going to spit out code that you can run in user space. It's going to give you machine code that is, uh, it's going to give you BPF code kind of like it gives um, a normal compilation machine code for x86 or for ARM or anything like that. But this is specifically tailored to BPF code. It is also specifically tailored to x86 BPF code. You can give different compiler flags using the, uh, the dash D um, underscore underscore target target arch underscore something here. Um, to give it like you want this, um, you want to be able to like cross compile for ARM or something like that. Um, but the BPF that I'm that I'm compiling is going to be run on the very same machine, so it's it's going to be outputting to x86 BPF code, and I'm going to be running this on an x86 kernel that runs x86 BPF code. So let's do let's do the the stage of turning our code into a, a our BPF code into an object file. So I've compiled it up and we can now see that we've got this exec bpf.o and if we do a read elf of that we can see that it's it's pretty small but it's it's got some stuff in here. Um, uh, there's not much Disassemble all isn't showing me anything here, but yeah, it's 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 an object file. It's it's got stuff into here, but we're our program is not actually going to use this object file. The next stage of compilation is turning that object file into this into this skeleton um, that we will use to give us these three functions. So let's take a look at how to do that. And the way you generate the skeleton is using the BPF tool again. You say gen skeleton, you give the object file, and then I am specifically giving, giving myself kind of a, a name. So the exec name correlates to the exec here. So if I was to do, um, if I was to give it a name of exec stuff, I would have to rename my functions exec stuff. So it's going to, it's, it's kind of like doing a namespace, but with C you don't have a namespace, so it's, it's doing the best it can. So it's, it's giving us the, the functions for open, load, and attach. And it's putting all of that stuff in exec scale.h. So let's generate it. Now, I also want to emphasize that you no longer need the object file anymore, and that's why I'm removing it. So let's, do, let's generate the skeleton and remove the currently existing object file. So now the object file is gone but we have this exec scale.h file. And let's take a look at it. So it's got a structure here for an exec, and that is the name 
that is directly correlated to the name that I gave it. Um, and it's also got various functions like destroy, create skeleton, um, open options, and the ones that we care about for this very simple program of open, load, and attach. So yeah, that, that's all we need. And um, libbpf is going to take care of all the hard stuff underneath by calling bpf object attach skeleton, detach skeleton, um, doing the open ops with kind of allocating memory, all that stuff. It's um, libbpf through this generated file is doing all the hard work for us so that all we have to do is do these three simple functions. So back to the make file, the last step that we want to do is up here in that we want to compile our user space program. So I'm using Clang to generate the user space program but I could easily do it with, with GCC as well. And it's just a normal compilation progress, but I'm linking it against libbpf. So I'm saying, turn my C program into an executable program, linking in libbpf. So let's do that. So now I have the exec binary and I can go ahead and run it. And with any BPF call, um, you need to, to do it as super user because um, normal users, unless you, you play with the, the capabilities function with, with uh, Linux, um, normally your BPF programs do not have the capability to use the BPF syscall. So you have to do this as the root user or play with capabilities to do this. So we run it and we get back to the output inside of the, uh, the tracing area that BPF provides us. So that is the basically hello world of BPF in C using um, libbpf. So let's take this uh, a step further and let's, um, let's pass some information from our um, BPF code up to the user space at runtime so that we can see what's going on, so that we can see these, these execs being called. So I've got that, um, that code in a, the ring buffer sample program. So if we go into the ring buff, we see basically the same stuff here with the addition of an H file. So what's in the H file? The H file is simply a structure that um, our BPF code will fill and our user space code will read and empty using something called a BPF ring buffer. So let's jump into what this BPF ring buffer is. So let me get my source code area into the ring buffer area and let's open up the exec.c file and The, the BPF file. So our BPF code is a little bit more complex. So what we're doing here is basically the same thing. Um, we're just doing a handle exec VE, but this time around, I actually want to look at the parameters um, being called into exec VE. And those parameters, um, I'm, I'm using an exec parameters um, structure that I have generated. Um, and I have gotten the knowledge about how to generate this structure from a file on the system. And I need to be pseudo to look at this. There is a f an area on the system in syskernel uh, debug event tracing events. So inside of here, there is syscalls. And now, now this, this tracing kind of corresponds to TP. These are trace points. This stands for trace points. And the syscalls corresponds to syscalls here. So if we go into syscalls, we will see 
that there is a since sys enter exec ve directory right here this is a directory and if we go into this sys enter exec ve directory there are files called uh, enable filter format blah 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 all that we care about is format so if we take a look at format this sort of tells us well, that didn't help at all this sort of tells us the the c structure um that we want to use so so yeah uh, you can take a look at these every every trace point has these so if you wanted to look at exit um you can look at sys enter exit which is kind of a weird way of saying it but um trace points are broken down into trace points for sys calls are broken down into entering the syscall and exiting the syscall. So I want to look at the parameters being passed in at the entry point to the syscall. And that's what this format file gives me. So let me fix my screen. So that's where I got this from. So the first, the first 128 bits represent all of this stuff that I don't care about. So you can see that I do care about the file or the file name. And the file name starts at offset 16. So 16 times 8 is 128. So we don't care about bytes 0 through 127, which is what I'm saying with these two unused portions here. So my structure will be able to give me the file name. That's what this, this exec params structure does for me. So I'm getting a little into the weeds here, but what I'm doing is um, I'm using this, this call, this BPF helper called BPF ring buff reserve. And what that does is it reserves me an area of space onto this RB structure. So to create that RB structure, it is a BPF map. And it is a BPF map of type ring buff. And it has um, 256 times 124 entries into it. So it's, it's got a lot of space that I can utilize here um, to do stuff. Uh, it's got more space than I want, but I just allocated that and it, it's it's fine. It, it uses it, it's not too much. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, in order to use this ring buffer, first you allocate the space by using this reserve. Um, we check to make sure that the reserve worked properly, that there is space. So for example, if I didn't allocate enough space here and my ring buffers were not emptied properly by my user space, I would start to error out because I would not be able to reserve any more space in the ring buffer here. Um, but assuming that there is enough space in the ring buffer, I start passing in the, the thread group identifier, the process identifier, the current com name of the process executing, um, the file name of what the process is going to turn into, and then I submit all of this to the user space. So let's take a look at the user space. How do I use the ring buffer in a user space? So as you can see, we've got these three functions like in the very simple hello world program, um, but we also do a ring buffer new and we grab the file descriptor to that ring buffer map. And then we give it a callback function that will fire um, whenever there is an event that we pull for. Um, these other parameters are for these other parameters are for using um, 
for giving shared context. So every time that the, the callback function fires, you can give it kind of context from what's happened before or what you want to pass into it from, from outside of the callback function. And it gives you some flags that I haven't gone into researching about. So there's more, more to, to do here if you wanted to, but you don't need to do anything other than um, pass in the file descriptor to the ring, um, the file descriptor of the ring buffer map into this new call and the, um, the callback function that will fire whenever there is an event. And then we start polling the ring buffer for the events. So when there is a new event, event ET will fire and this event ET simply prints out the information that we copied into this ring buffered area structured by an exec EVT that we have inside of our exec.h file. So we populate this exec VT, e, EVT in BPF and we read it out inside of our user space code. Um, we read it out and print it to the, the uh, standard out. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, a little bit more complex than the hello world, but it's not too much to, to get your head around. So let's give this a run. And let's fire off some functions here. So we can see that when I call LL, when I call LL, so the way that Linux processes are created is that for, for what I'm doing here, when I type ls on the, on the command line, I am typing ls as a command that bash will run. So what bash does is it forks the process, which under the hood is using the clone system call. So it clones itself. So at, at the time that clone finishes, we have two processes running bash. One of the processes goes on as bash and it forgets about what's happening with the other process. The second process goes, I am then going to turn myself into LS or I am going to turn myself into user bin LS. And then, but at the point of the trace point of sys exec enter, it has not yet turned itself into LS because LS might have an error. You might not be allowed to run LS. Um, LS might not exist. So what happens if I just type in, well, gobbledygook, uh, bash understands gobbledygook, um, but, uh, yeah, is there something that I'm not allowed to run? Oh, yeah, there is something I'm not allowed to run. I am not allowed. No, I am allowed to run that program. Uh, let's go in back into simple and we'll make it and we will chmod this. We will sudo chone this to root root. And then we will chmod this um, to 700 so that my user should no longer be allowed to exec this. So permission is denied. So it tried to run exec, it couldn't, and therefore um, it didn't, the, the process did not turn itself into exec because we did, um, our user does not have permissions to do so. Um, yeah, I'm getting a little into the weeds there too. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the whole point is just to show that now we have um, BPF code communicating with our user space code. And that is pretty simple here. Three small... Um, three small files, 
Um, uh, exec is uh, 51 lines long. The BPF code is 39 lines long and the H file is 11 long, lines long. So it's a very small program to be able to communicate whenever an exec is attempted to be executed on your, on your system. Um, so let's get more complicated. How, so the next step is I wanted to learn about how to use traffic control. And I don't want to go don't want to go deep into traffic control because this is this is something that you you have to explore for yourself um, and I'm giving you the tools to start exploring it for yourself but I do want to get into the code a little bit because it goes back into my argument against C there is um, this code that I'm about to show you is getting a little bit hairy and it's getting uh, there's getting into reasons why I would not want to, to do a real project with traffic control with BPF in the C programming language. And I wanna, I wanna show that to you. Um, so yeah, let me do a make clean here, make sure everything's nice and clean and move into the TC area. And again, we only have three files. The make file is similar to the, um, the exec programs that we've been running before. There's a few more things in here that I've 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 shown. Um, so I'm doing this. I don't need to do this. I'm just doing it. Um, I'm also kind of want to compile my C level code. Um, there's a warning that is that is happening because I'm doing a for loop badly. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically the same thing here. Um, we're we're getting the VM Linux, we're getting our BPF object, we're turning our BPF object into a skeleton, and then we are compiling our user space code using that skeleton to give us both BPF code and user space code that we can communicate back and forth into. So the things that I'm gonna demonstrate with this TC is first of all, kind of how to start off with TC, and secondly is how to inject from user space into BPF rather than the other way around. So, let me get out of this area and go into the TC directory. And let's look at the TC code. So, first of all, how do you do TC? Because TC is a little bit different than that exec stuff. So we've got the same old um, memory limit bumper. Um, I've got some helper functions here that I don't want to get into. Um, we also need a signal handler for when you press control C on the command line. Um, and I will demonstrate why we need that in, the, in a second here. Um, we've got a much larger um, BPF ring buffer handler here. Um, and it's obviously in the state of development, as you can see, I've got some, some commented early returns, stuff like that, but it, it's, it's mostly the same. It's just reading from a ring buffer and printing out the information from that ring buffer. So I don't want to get too deep into this. It's just, a, just the event handler doing prints to standard out. Um, but there are some funny stuff here. So first of all, there's this declare libbpf ops. So what this is doing is it's a, it's a nice um, macro which allows me to create a structure, a BPF TC hook structure, given the name hook, and fill it with a few values here. So uh, let me set my wrap on. So it's allowing me to fill some of the fields in this structure with, I'm giving it a, an interface index to look at, and the interface index is two, and that correlates to the interface index of two here. 
So what I'm doing is my TC will attach to this interface. So ENP8S0, which is the interface that I plug my Ethernet wire into. Um, and it's also um, attaching to egress. So egress is outward bound traffic. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to attach a hook that will look at outward bound traffic. Um, I'm then doing some option stuff as well. Um, don't want to get too deep, deep into that. That is your homework. If you care about it, this is your homework. So the next thing is that um, we need to handle, we need to do signal handlers because I am only opening and loading my skeleton here. I am not attaching my skeleton. Instead, I am creating that hook point, that TC hook point, and I am attaching the TC hook point. So for some reason, when you do a, when you attach the TC um, hook point, if you do not call detach properly, the hook remains inside of the kernel. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is if I do a make uh, and then I make block. So I'm now running my firewall and I'm blocking a whole bunch of different stuff. If I kill that, so if I do a sudo pkill dash nine, so I'm gonna kill it with prejudice. If I kill that program, I am still not going to be able to do stuff because oops, because the the hook is still inside of the kernel stopping me from doing stuff. And we can see that using the BPF tool to show programs. And we will see that my program called handle egress, which correlates to this function is still in the kernel. So all of this code is still running and it's been told when I, when I started it up to block me from basically everything, everything except ARP, um, it's blocking me from. Um, so yeah, if, if you don't close up, if you don't detach your hook properly, um, your code is gonna remain in the kernel, which is not desirable. Unless, of course, it is desirable. Unless, of course, you want to inject your hook and just leave your user space and let the hook run without any user space interaction. You might, you might want to do that. Um, but for me, I don't want, I don't want my, my blocking to be called. So I can get around this by rerunning my blocking and then exiting it, exiting it properly. So as we can see, we no longer have that program installed in the kernel. And if we take a look at the trace pipe, it's no longer running. It's no longer running here. We're not getting any print out, print outs from it. So yeah, um, it is a little bit different in that way. So yeah, instead of attaching the skeleton, I'm getting a hook and I'm getting the information about how I want to create the hook from the skeleton. So I'm getting the FD to the map of the, I'm, I'm getting the FD to the program um, from the skeleton and I'm attaching using that. Um, and go through the code to kind of 
have a full walkthrough for yourself. That's your homework here. Um, now, another, another um, important point is that I am still using the ring buffer like before. Uh, nothing's changed. Um, I'm not using a forever loop. I'm instead looking for a variable that I set during the signal handler. So I've, I've set a signal handler to look for uh, control C's and I forget what the sig term is, but what is sig term? Uh, 15. So kill dash 15, I'm, I'm looking for that as well. And uh, kill dash two, which is what control C or in my case, control K gives me. Um, um, yeah, so when, when those signals come to my program, I'm going to set a global variable called exiting to true, and I'm going to stop my looping when that happens, and at that point in time, I'm gonna detach, um, detach my hook so that I don't leave anything lying around in the kernel. Um, but yeah, um, so this is the basics on how to inject a TC program and if you want to see the full specifics of the TC program, it's up on my GitHub. I certainly do not want to do a line by line. I do want to show you, or let me, let me, I'll get back to that in a second. The other important point that I want to look at is how do you communicate from the user space into the kernel? Now you can use other maps to do that. So the map that I'm going to use is called a just an array. So it's an array like like you normally think of. Well, it's it's a map that acts like an array that you think of when you're C programming. Um, this map is called ports, and what I'm going to do with ports is that for every um, value that I set on the command line when I run. So if I were to run with with these command um, arguments, these, these port numbers, I am going to update an element inside of that port, inside of that ports map. And to get that ports, that ports map, you again use the skeleton to get the FD of the map, to get the file descriptor of that map. And then you can use the helper call called, sorry, I'm jumping around so much here. The helper call called BPF map update LM to inject values into it. So what I'm doing here is that I am incrementing key every time that I call allow port. So the first time I am setting index zero to the value that I give it. Um, and that value in this case is going to be 22. And then the next time I am going to update an element in that array to 80, then 53, then 53, 55, and then 443. And what happens here is that the the map is read by the kernel at runtime to look at those values. The kernel does this, or the BPF code in the kernel does this by using lookup LM. So I'm looking up zero, and then one, and then two, and then three, and I'm getting a value out of it from the map called ports. So if there is an item, it will return it as a pointer called port. And that is a U16. I am then dereferencing it, checking to see if the port that I'm trying to use is in this list. And if it's in this list, I'm going to allow it with TC OK. Um, if not, um, I'm... I'm blocking it. Um, so yeah, that's how you can inject information from user space into the kernel by using one of these maps. There's various different types of maps. There's hash maps, there is array maps, there's um, hash maps per CPU, there's array maps per CPU so that 
each CPU on your system, if you've got a multi-core CPU, they each have their own version of these maps. Um, yeah, there's, there's various different types of maps that you can use to communicate. There is one other way in which you can communicate with the, the BPF code, and that's using globals, global, um, global variables. So I am going to use a global variable up here called my PID, and I'm going to check my PID um, at the start of handle egress to see if the thread group of the current the 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 process currently trying to send um, a packet that is being handled by handle egress as part of the TC um, architecture the TC network architecture um, I'm going to check if that PID is the same as my PID and if my PID is trying to send a packet then I'm just going to blanket saying I am allowed to use the network so my process, whatever I set as my PID, is allowed to, to do anything it wants. So what is my PID? My PID is, what is my PID here? Did I not do it? My PID is up here. So from the skeleton, there's uh, an area called BSS, and this is where global variables are kept. Um, I am simply setting my PID to be the same as the value returned from get PID. And if you know your C, get PID will tell you the PID of the currently running process. So what this means is that when I run TC, this process is allowed to use the network willy-nilly to do whatever it wants. Um, I'm, not use, I'm not actually doing anything with that, I'm not actually making any network calls from this program, but if I were to do that, I can. With, and and my, my filter, my firewall would not block it. Um, so yeah, uh, that is another way in which you can communicate from user space into BPF. So yeah, what we've covered here is um, we've done a simple libbpf program using C. We've added to that simple libbpf program to have a ring buffer to communicate from the BPF code in the kernel into user space. And then we've, we've blown up our program to doing TC work, um, to attaching to, to TC, to doing an egress firewall, blocking various ports, allowing various ports and stuff like that. Um, and I promise to get back to why I don't want to be doing this stuff in C. So this is an egressing firewall. That's all it's doing is it's hooking into egress at the, uh, the TC layer so that when we are making, we are communicating a pack word, packet outward to the network, we are going to intercept it using this handle egress filter, this classifier, and either block it or allow it as the program desires. The problem is, what if I also wanted to add in the same program an incoming firewall? Well, I would have to, I would have to add another handler here so I would I would do uh, a sec classifier int handle ingress struct underscore underscore sk buff but say I wanted a separate ring buffer for the ingress versus the egress I've only got a single thread going on here. So if, if I were to have, if, uh, if I were to do a ring buffer poll for ingress, let's, let's pretend that I've made an ingress ring buffer. Now we've got a pro 
problem because we're single threaded and we're only looking at one of these ring buffers at a time. So if our ring buffer, if, if, we, if we take a long time handling one of these ring buffers, then our other ring buffer might get starved. So ideally, what we want to do is have two threads. We want to have one thread handling the, handling the egress and a different thread handling the ingress. And now we're starting to get into multi-processing, parallel processing, concurrent processing, which C is very bad with. So at this stage, if I want to add an ingress firewall to this program, I, I should move to either Rust or Go. Uh, I could do it in Python, but I personally find it easier to do it with Rust or Go. Um, yeah, C is just not made for this multi-threading workload that I want to do. The domain is specifically telling me, stop using C. So, so yeah, that's getting back to when not to use C, when you want to use parallelism in which I'm getting into at this point in time. So yeah, um, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to give you a demonstration of why do you see to explore, but why not do you see when you want to like start doing real work, when you want to start doing some parallelism. Yeah. So I hope you have learned something. I hope you've learned how to start exploring with libbpf using C. And I hope you have a good day or a good evening or a good afternoon.